Teaching is what's true for people in general, but preaching is for you. It's another thing we talked about in Sunday school. We need to know that the Bible applies to us. And preaching includes both the law and the gospel applied to you. The law refers to any time God gives us a command, whether that command is in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. Sometimes we use the word law to mean just the Old Testament, but that's, that's not true. Anytime there's a commandment, that's a synonym for a law. The gospel is any time God gives us a promise of his grace, whether that's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. God made lots of good news promises in the Old Testament to be believed also. And in Romans, Paul summarizes the good news of the gospel that he preaches about Jesus. But he also reminds us of what God's righteous demands of us are, and he says, We already know what they are. Now, Jewish Christians who knew God's written law probably liked Paul's argument against the sinfulness and lawlessness of the Gentiles in Romans 1. When we heard about that spiral downward last week, we probably thought about others being caught in that spiral. But Gentile Christians who knew God's law from nature are probably the ones who appreciated Paul's argument against the judgmentalism of the Jews for not keeping the written law that Paul's about to get into in Romans 2. Okay, let's be honest about ourselves for a minute. Let's not fall into the trap of thinking about Romans as being only for others, but also for us. That's the difference between reading Romans to teach us and for Romans to preach to us. Is Romans only talking about others or is Romans talking about us? Now, Paul will say that God's promise was not for Abraham alone, but also for us when we get to Romans 4. And the same is true of God's law. It's not just for others. Paul has God's law aimed directly at us. And look out, he's a good shot. He's going to get us. Here we are, Romans 2, verses 1 through 5, and listen for the yous in this. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. For whatever, for At whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them, yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Did anyone notice how many yous I missed while I was underlining? I thought I got them all when I was going through this, but I missed about half of them. Who's Paul talking to? He's talking to you. Okay? He says, you have no excuse, no defense, no apologetic when you condemn, pass judgment, or judge others as guilty. You can't defend yourself from God's judgment if you agree that God's law is good. Right? Right? we agree God's law is good, then we're in trouble. We have a problem then, because we've broken it. He says, you know God's judgment and wrath on those who do such things is based on truth. And later on, he says that we know that it is righteous. But you do the same things that you agree God should judge when someone else does them. He says, you have a stubborn or hard heart or an unrepentant, unchanging heart 
or mind. The word repentance is one of the two main words that having a correct definition of led to the Reformation. The word repentance literally means a change of heart or mind. See, our problem is not just on the outside. We need to change our minds before changing our actions is going to do any good for us. We need to be convinced that it's wrong. We've got hearts that don't want to change. And Paul says you show contempt for God's kindness. Other versions say you presume on God's kindness, or you think lightly of God's kindness, or you despise God's kindness. Is that usually the part that we think badly about? God's kindness, goodness to us? We think badly about that? He says we think badly about God's kindness by thinking about God judging others and cheering for it, and thinking about God judging us and booing it. We need to be cheering that God is offering his kindness to everyone. And God's kindness is what's meant to lead you to repentance, even more than his wrath is. Don't we usually do this the other way around? God is mad, and therefore you should repent. He's saying God's mad, and he's kind, and the kindness is what should get you to change your mind. There's hope. Remember from the psalm? There's, he's good and loving. If God was just good, that could only lead to us who are not good being destroyed. But he's good and he's loving. God. Here's what Paul says about God. God's judgment is coming. God's wrath are coming. He talked about the day of God's wrath, which is a synonym for the day of the Lord that we saw through the minor prophets. It's wrong for us to judge others, but it's right for God to judge us and he will. That's what Paul is saying. And God's kindness or goodness includes these words, tolerance, synonym for that is forbearance, restraint, patience, long-suffering. God puts up with us for a long time. These attributes of God are good, and they're good for us. But do you notice that there's what kind of attributes these are? These are the kind of attributes of you're going to get in trouble, but I'm not doing it yet. Do you you see that? Even in these attributes he's talking about, he's talking about the goodness of God protects us from God's own righteousness, still affirmed in the way he's talking about this. See, it's only God's goodness revealed in Jesus that saves us from God's own righteousness. I heard someone summarize it this way this week. Sometimes we think about God like this. Um, God's nice, you're nice, so everyone should just be nice. Is that an accurate summary of the gospel? No. God is perfectly good, you're not, and God would be right to judge you, so therefore we've got to come to God to forgive us and now live that out. That's very different than the first nice way I talked about that at the beginning. It's God's kindness, not his wrath, that leads us towards repenting or changing our mind. So we we have to understand that his kindness is in regard to his wrath, but it's his kindness that lets us. Because let's be honest, if we've already blown it and there's no hope, we might as well just get what good we can out of life and that's all we got coming, right? No reason to change your mind if you're already headed over the cliff and there's no hope, just speed up. But God is offering us an off-ramp. And that's what gets us to change our mind, to repent. Notice he's still talking about what God has revealed. We we heard that God's wrath and righteous judgment is being revealed, and now he says that it will be revealed in the future. But God's, the righteousness from God is also revealed in the gospel. See, the gospel is the good news that God provides us with his own righteousness as a gift in Jesus, which saves us from God's wrath or judgment which is also righteous. Remember that? He calls it his righteous judgment. It's not like God is just in a bad mood. God really is right to judge this way. Even that is righteous. It's not like this this judgment is bad on God's part. It's good on God's part. That's a problem for us. 
God's kindness is response to his own judgment for you before it is for anyone else. In Jesus, God is good and kind and tolerant and patient with you. He forgives you and changes your heart. That's the good news for you. But now Paul is going to shift and focus. This is also true. This bad news and this good news applies to everyone too. Okay? It's for you first, but it also is for everyone. Here's where Paul goes with that. Listen to who he's addressing this to. Each person, those who, every human being who, Jews and Gentiles. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. You hear how he's referring to people this time? Every human being. Some translations have that every soul of man. That's literally every human psyche. All of us. Gentiles. The word here is literally Greeks, those who are Hellenized. And Jews, that are people of Judah or Israel. And God's judgment and wrath and his gift of righteousness apply to you and to everyone else. Now, he's got these categories here. Those who do good versus those who do evil. This word for do, does, done, or doing is the word works or deeds. Literally, it's energy. We put our whole selves, all our efforts into what we do, and what we do shows who we are. And he says everyone who seeks glory, honor, and immortality versus those who seek themselves, reject the truth, and follow evil. See, this is a desire issue, not just an action issue. Again, before we can change our actions, we have to change our minds and our hearts, which is what the word repent means. And God is described here as the one who shows no favoritism, no partiality, or is no respecter of persons. God doesn't care who you are, doesn't change what he does. Psalm 62 and Proverbs 24 both use this phrase reflecting on God's justice in judging fairly regardless of who he judges. He gives to each person according to what he has done. God's justice is good, but God's justice is not good news for anyone who has ever sinned. God's not impressed with who you are. He's not going to change his judgment of you based on you being such a nice person. Or on you being what ethnicity you are, your, your family background, or your religious background, or any of that. God's not impressed with it. God will give, literally repay, or give back to. He will give what we deserve or earned to all of us. For some, that is wrath and anger or trouble and distress, given at the final judgment to those who deserve it or have earned it. But he will give glory, honor, and immortality. It's interesting, in one of the lists, immortality is a synonym for peace on the other list, Glory, honor, and peace. Peace, lasting peace that comes from not dying. Did you see that our problem is we're, we're mortal. That's literally corruptible. We're going bad. We're rotting. God's not like that. He's not going to go bad. He has no shelf life. He's going to live forever. And what we need from him is this peace, this, this wholeness, this, this good state that he has. We need to live forever by God's life. Otherwise, we're going to go off eventually. And this 
glory, honor, and immortality and peace are given at the final judgment to those who seek God and do good. Okay, so here's the question. Can we ever earn this? Does God's fairness in rewarding help or hurt us? Is that good news? Doesn't matter who you are, God will give you exactly what you deserve. Do we hear that and go, yay? Or do we hear that and go, oh no? Paul continues, he's talking to all who, those who, and brings up again Gentiles. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. All who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous or justified. Indeed, Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law. They are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. The people here are all who, those who, as many who, whoever, whosoever, depending on what translation you're reading from. It mentions Gentiles, which is the word for ethnicities or nations. These are all different ways of saying that this judgment of God applies to everyone. All who sin, that's the word for miss the mark in archery. That's anywhere but the dead center of the bullseye. The mark is the middle. And if we're pretty good because we almost hit the target, that's still missing the mark. And if you're pretty good because you hit the second ring out from the center of the target, that's still missing the mark. And if you hit the mark in one, with one arrow and miss with the other, it's still missing the mark. All who sin are up against this. And he says, those who sin apart from the law or sin without the law, will perish apart from the law or without the law. This word for perish is literally be destroyed without the law. If you don't have the law, you'll be destroyed without the law. Not having the law won't save you from the destruction of God's judgment. So why is it saying, I I didn't know any better. I didn't didn't know where the mark was we were all aiming for. I didn't know. I was just shooting my bow at random. I didn't know what we were aiming at. It says that will not work as an excuse. But those who sin under the law, or sin in the law, will be judged by the law. In other words, they'll go to law or go to court with God. Is that good news? See, having the law doesn't save you from God's judgment either. Only obeying it would save you. Then he focuses on the Jews here, those who hear the law, or literally listen to the law. This is the same word James uses in James 1. And then he says, hearing it or listening to it, even actively listening to it, doesn't help unless you obey it or you do the law. Again, same word James uses in James 1. Paul and James use the same word and agree that the only way that the law could save you is if you obeyed it. Knowing, memorizing, and posting the Ten Commandments can't save you. Only obeying them could. Now, the law for Gentiles, he says, you do by nature, or instinctively, or you do naturally, things required by the law, or you do the works of the law. You ever notice this? People who have never heard about God sometimes do really good things. Sometimes the neighbors who live near you, who don't believe in Jesus, will help you in ways that are just amazing and wonderful. They do the things, they love their neighbor as themselves, And it shows, and you go, wow, that's amazing. 
Paul says that shows that the law is written on our hearts. Probably not referring to Jeremiah 31, this, this different way that God writes the law on our hearts, changes our hearts in the new covenant, but rather everyone by virtue of being made in God's image has right and wrong already written on your heart from the time you're born. And everyone has some sense of right and wrong, even if it's limited or even if it's twisted. Do you notice that? I think sometimes growing up, we thought that people who didn't believe in Jesus didn't believe in right and wrong. And in reality, they do believe in right and wrong, even if they're telling you to do the wrong thing and it's really right. Have you ever heard those arguments? It seems like relativism is on the, on the decline. There's lots of people telling you, you should do this thing, and you listen and you go, that's the opposite of what I should be doing, but you're still telling me that I should do it and everyone should do it. You see, the problem is when people who don't have God's law do what's right, it shows that they do know better. And he says that God's going to judge men's secrets. God sees and judges the sin that's in our hearts. He sees our thoughts, which is literally our conflicting thoughts. See, because you've got these thoughts of, I should help my neighbor. You also have the opposite kind of thoughts. <coughs> He talks about their conscience also testifying. The word conscious is awareness or knowledge of God's law. The fact that they have a conscience shows that they're conscious of God's law. And it's accusing them, it's bearing witness against them that they know God's law. It's also defending or excusing them. It's providing an apologetic against unfairly judging them. Because you know what? We know the law too. And everyone has morals that they believe are true that we can reason about God from. Have you ever heard this argument? Mere Christianity is where I first encountered this argument, where C.S. Lewis says, you want to know how to start by telling someone that they need to be forgiven of their sin? Just talk to them about what it's like when they're sinned against. They don't like it, right? We, We know stealing is wrong when we're the one being stolen from. And you can start by reasoning there. And we all know this. It's one of the ways you can start from scratch and argue someone that that believing in God is reasonable. Okay? But without getting God's righteousness from him, knowing right and wrong just shows that we should know better than to sin. We should know better. And God here, it says that The day that God will judge is coming. This is the day of God's wrath, the day of the Lord. God is the judge of the final judgment, not us, but judgment day is coming for everyone. And those who are righteous are righteous in God's sight or before God. Did you notice that? And those who are declared righteous or justified are declared righteous by God, not by us. We shouldn't be judging people as unrighteous or as righteous. God's the one who does that. Now, here's the strangest part here. In Sunday school, we're talking about technical terms where you use a term in a specific way and an author can use the same word in two different ways. And Paul gets done talking about God's wrath and he says, this is what my gospel declares. What's the definition of the gospel we came up with earlier? It's good news. Good news, everyone. Everyone is judged. This does not sound like good news. Listen to this verse. Does this sound like good news to you? Those who obey the law are those who will be declared righteous. Does that sound like good news to you? Doesn't to me. Okay, I've got an objection here. Is Paul teaching in places here that people can be saved without Jesus? See, out of context, parts of Romans 2 sound like Paul is saying people can be saved without Jesus. Listen to these pieces I can pull out here. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. There will be glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first to the Jew, then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. Right? Sounds like you can be saved without Jesus. Here's another one. can pull this out of context. It is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles do by nature things required by the law, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. 
Sounds good, doesn't it? Okay, so the first option is, are those who seek, do good, and obey the law people who are righteous on their own? In other words, they're people who God doesn't need to give righteousness to. They already have their own righteousness. Or, some people think that those who seek, those who do good, and those who obey the law describes Christians. But does God give his righteousness to, oh, no, sorry. God does give his righteousness to those who find him in Jesus. That is true. But is that because we're good? Is God looking for good people to give his righteousness to? That, that option doesn't fit. The third option is that those who seek, those who do good, and those who obey the law describes no one. See, God wouldn't need to give his righteousness to a righteous person. The only problem is that people with their own righteousness don't exist. And based on the context, this third option makes the best sense of Paul's argument. We've got to look at the context. And last week, I talked about one danger of missing the forest of good news in the trees of our sin. The next six weeks, we're in the bad news section of Romans, and I'm going to have to bring in the gospel from somewhere else. That's one danger of focusing too narrowly is we're missing the flow of the whole argument. He's getting to the gospel here. He just hasn't given it to us yet. We can miss the gospel by going too slow, but we can also miss the law by focusing in too narrowly on just one verse. Now, you can catch that a quote is being used out of context most clearly when both the full quote and the edit are both short. Let me give you an example. If I ask you the question, do you think I want you to play in the street? And then I edit that down to, I want you to play in the street. I did not change a single one of the words that I kept, but I completely reversed the meaning of that. And a good test of reading something in context is restating your understanding to see if it fits the author's intent. For example, you should always repeat a math problem along with the answer that you got to see if it makes sense. Right? 100 is a real, valid, true number. Right? 100 is a real number. It's good. It's a good number. It's only when you go back and you reread the question, and the question is 1 plus 1, that you can tell that 100 is obviously false. Right? So you've got to go back and ask, so what, what's Paul doing here? What, what's the question? What's the problem Paul's set up? And here's the options. What, what's Paul arguing for here in Romans 2? Is Paul arguing that all people need the gospel of Jesus that he's preaching? That's option one. Or is Paul arguing that only some people need this message of good news? Yeah, it's the first one, isn't it? See, we have to ask which option fits Paul's thesis statement for the whole book and the conclusion of his argument in this section. Remember, this is the thesis statement of the whole book of Romans. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. He's arguing that it's for everyone. It's a righteousness that comes from God and that you need it regardless of who you are. And he concludes this section of talking about the law at the end of Romans chapter 3 where we're getting in four more weeks. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Paul's argument is that the law is designed to silence every mouth in the whole world so that no one thinks that they can be declared righteous or justified in God's sight by observing the law. Let me summarize it for you. If you are tempted to say that you can be righteous by observing the law, shut your mouth. 
That's from the uh, legacy standard version of the Bible. You see, Paul's gospel applies to us and to everyone. And the reason Paul's gospel applies to us and to everyone is that God's law applies to all of us first. God's law, as summarized in Romans 2, includes two errors to avoid. The first one Paul mentions is don't judge others. This message is for you. Don't judge others. But the second error is don't claim that God doesn't judge sin. God is the judge who always judges everyone justly, rightly, and fairly. But if you agree that God is right to judge others, you have no excuse for your own sin. The wrath or judgment of God will be revealed on the day of the Lord, judgment day that's coming. And God can already see the secrets in our hard, stubborn, unchanging, unrepentant hearts right now. And God's wrath is already being revealed by allowing that sin that is inside of us to come out. And having God's law written in the Bible can't save us from God's judgment because we have not obeyed what is written there. And not having God's written law in the Bible can't save anyone from judgment either because our hearts and actions show that we know better. Anyone relying on the law, either in nature or in the Bible, can only be judged and destroyed. It's the only result that can come from that. The solution is to change your mind. Stop judging others and claiming that God won't judge you. Agree with God that you are unrighteous and hold on to the righteousness that he offers you in Jesus. Change your mind about what you're holding on to. Are you trying to hold on to your own actions as the thing that's going to save you? Change your mind about that. Repent. Don't do that. Hold on to God's gift of righteousness found in Jesus. It's your only hope. You see, This bad news is what Paul's gospel declares, but the rest of Paul's gospel is good news. The gospel is the power of God to save you by believing in Jesus. And God's power to save you from judgment is the same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. See, God has a righteousness by which he is righteous, but he also gives us his righteousness in Jesus. That's because Jesus, who is God, became a man and lived a perfect life in your place for you. He always did everything right, and he did that every moment of every day for you. And then at the end of his life, he died on the cross, the death that you deserve to die. He died for you in your place. And then he rose from the dead, and he gives us the life that he's earned in trade for the death that we've earned. And God's giving you this righteousness. That's what Paul's saying. And Jesus has gone back to heaven where he gives us his spirit, which is the only hope we have of actually changing our hearts or minds. And he's there to talk to God for us, to pray for us, to plead for us. He is also the righteous judge who's going to come back and righteously judge. Now that's good news because no one's going to get anything they don't deserve. But it's also bad news because everyone is going to get exactly what they deserve, even us. Unless we trade it in. And then he will be the righteous judge who can say to us, the unrighteous, he can call us the just. Hey, uh, Adamson children, can you tell me which one of the Narnia books? Edmund is described with a title. Edmund, who traded Aslan in. Edmund the traitor is described. His kingly name is Edmund the just. He's Edmund the righteous. Yeah. Aslan is the one who calls Edmund the traitor, Edmund the just. And that's what Jesus does for us. You are either the sinner in and of yourself, or you are the just in Jesus by gift from him.
That's the rest of Paul's gospel that we're going to get to. And it applies to everyone who believes it, including you. And if this is how you're coming to God, God, who is the perfectly righteous judge, who is right to have wrath and justice on sin, including yours, but God, who also has a kindness that calls you to change your mind, repent, stop looking at your own righteousness, and trust him. If that's how you're coming to God, through Jesus' righteousness, not your own, then Jesus himself invites you to come and eat at his table, the Lord's table. And not just to eat anything, but to eat him. It's his life that he's giving to you. And you know what? Preaching can go in one ear and out the other. I know it can't literally do that. But I mean, you can hear and not respond to preaching. But sometimes you can't even tell who's heard. The gospel is being given by Jesus at his table too. And you know what? It's going into your mouth. This is the gospel being heard by your mouth. And I can tell who it, we can tell who it's arrived to. So believe the gospel, trust in Jesus, take his life by faith and live. In Jesus, God forgives all your sin and declares you righteous by faith. So trust his promise and live.